Hello, my name is Gordy Holt, and this is Community Talk. Each of us has stories, stories that, that help us to understand and to explain our world. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people, people who have had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who have had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories that help us to better understand our world. And they help us to connect with each other. And Community Connections is about those people and about their stories. And I'm sure that you will enjoy meeting these amazing, amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay, I'm honored uh, today to be speaking with uh, Alison McNeil. Allison has been a great contributor to our community and to our country. And Allison, welcome to Community Connections. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a delight. It's a delight indeed. Can you tell us about uh, how you ended up getting to, well, first of all, I guess, start about your, your life in Princeton and how you moved there from there to Salmon Arm and how basketball has evolved for you over that period of time? Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people think that um, I kind of got my start in Princeton. And uh, my parents, obviously, I, I was born there, born and raised. My parents owned the movie theater in town. Uh, my dad worked at the hardware store part-time. He was a part owner of that. Uh, so Sorry, he was a part owner, but he worked there during the day. My mom worked at a dress shop, and then they both worked at the theater at night. And then my sister and I would go to the theater every night and work with them. So it was kind of a family business. And I always jokingly say that's where I got my work ethic because my parents... <laughs> took me to work every single night they paid me but um in my little bank account but uh yeah so I just I fell in love with basketball there um, a coach started me Arnie Carlson was his name and he actually had a connection to Stan Stewartson and he went to New West High and so it's just a weird kind of basketball story so he was my first coach in grade five and I just loved it and I did volleyball basketball track um I did uh cross country or sorry downhill skiing um and swimming was my first two community sports but then like it's ridiculous at my size that basketball was the one that I loved because at 5'3 that was probably crazy but yeah and then from there in grade 10 I kind of I went to my parents and said I want to move somewhere that was better basketball and they just looked at me like I was crazy but I pestered them for an entire year and finally going uh, that summer they said well I guess we'll look for a place and so we had two teachers at um, in Princeton one had come from Salmon Arm and Arnie had come from New West so we went and took a visit at New West, and I met Bob Gare, and then I we took a visit in Salmon Arm. But New West was like bigger, uh, the school was bigger than my town, was bigger than Princeton. And I just went, I can't go to New West. Went to Salmon Arm, and it seemed like a good fit. So I did grade 11, 12 there. And your team did all right there, too, didn't they? Okay, yeah. Yeah, we had, uh, I think, one undefeated season, and then we went, uh, they won four provincial championships in a row at that time, and I was there for two of them, yeah but lucky enough to play with arguably one of Canada's best players in Bev Smith. So when you're, one, when you're with the, on a team with her, you have a pretty good chance of winning some games. And you followed her to some coaching places too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And then we actually we played together at Oregon. And then, um, and then I went overseas to play in Germany. She went overseas to Italy to play. Then I came back and coached. And then um, she went down to Oregon. And uh, I'd finished, I kind of had decided I, I wanted to change at Simon Fraser. I'd been at Simon Fraser, so I followed her to Oregon. We coached there together. And then she took the national team job. And when she retired from that, um, I, re I had been one of her assistants and I took over that. So we've, yeah, Bev and I've done a lot together over the years. And she was in my wedding party too. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's a remarkable woman as well. Yeah, incredible, yeah. incredible woman. Yeah. So, yeah national team and then that ended up being a 16 years in the national team program mm -hmm. and before you got there you coached a Simon Fraser I did yeah 13 years at SFU and I loved that um Lauren Davies was the AD there at the time and um he had an Oregon connection so I knew when I applied that I'd probably have a pretty good chance of getting an interview because I went to Oregon and he was a that guy and so um I did get the interview and lucky enough to be up there for 13 great years mm -hmm. loved it and um loved all the coaches had some really great teams um I think we put maybe eight or nine, maybe more players into the national team program and won a lot of games and just had a lot of fun. Thank you. We got to the final four a couple of times. And yeah, we did got four times to the final twice and never did win it, but uh, very proud of all the teams we had there. Yeah. So and then you moved from there to, uh, to Oregon? 
Yep. Um, yeah. So I finished at SFU and I actually had taken, I, I had I'd left SFU, retired per se, and uh, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but thought I wanted to get into youth sport, which will bring us all the way back to Semiamu because <laughs> like, I really, I want to be with younger kids. I want to influence and be involved. And then Bev got the job at Oregon and she called and said, love for you and Mike to come down, my husband, Mike, and assist with us. And I ended up being an associate head coach. And so we did go came back because my mom got um, uh, very ill. So we, we did come back. And, uh, but at that time I thought, no, I'll go into youth coaching, but that happened. And the national team happened. And then, you know, st- I don't know, I was just really enjoying my job. So yeah, I spent, uh, we spent four years at Oregon before coming back, went to the NCAA tournament, won the WNIT, um, had some really, really good teams there too and enjoyed it. And then when you went to the, uh, the national team, they, what they were, your ranking moved up dramatically over that period of time you were there. Yeah, very proud. So um, I was involved in the program for 16 years, but 12 with the senior team as the head coach, um, almost 12. And I think when our staff took over, um, we were, I believe, ranked 21 or 22 in the world. And when we left, we were eight, uh, eight or nine, and now they're four. So it's it's been fun to watch that um, ascent and Lisa Tomitis who's the coach now was um, my assistant for 12 years we worked together with national team so it's been a super transition she's a great coach she's taken it to even greater heights and yeah it's pretty neat to see because for all of us kind of basketball crazy people to not see your national team be good is hard like you, you want it to be good and you've put a lot of time in so now to see both the men's and women's programs just where they're at is well, so much fun yeah. and you had a great yeah. win uh at the Olympics. Yeah. So, well, the Olympics were amazing. So we qualified for the Olympics on Canada Day in 2012. It was just, we got the last possible berth. Yeah. So people, we weren't really expected to get there. We were maybe, it was a, we thought maybe a quad away. Well, we expected to get there. But, and, then, <laughs> and so that was so exciting. We got there and then we got a pretty tough draw. We ended up with Great Britain in, in our pool play. And I think it was that game to go to the final eight. Uh, with the pleasure of having to play the Americans. Um, but <laughs> yeah, we beat them. Um, and it was a packed house uh, in London and a really pretty, I will not say a, a tough crowd, but certainly not a crowd for us. Yeah. And, uh, and it was just a great win. We played really well and um, moved on to play the Americans. And that was our best finish in, I think, 20 or 32 years or something, a long time. So, and, and now we've gone, the women, back to back to back Olympics. So London, Rio, and then, well, hopefully 2021 in Japan. And yeah. yeah, I think there's wasn't there a great story about you getting there a bit early and wanting to climatize you and the team and uh, found you were the only ones there. Can you tell us yeah. about that? Yeah, well, it was funny. So our sports psychologist has said they've done lots of studies and that if you get to an Olympics or major games early, move your team in and climatize and you feel like you own the place. And it did work. We got there early. There were no other teams. Actually, in 2012 in London, there was only women's basketball and women's soccer that had actually made the Olympics. So I think for our next Olympics, we have nine teams, which is amazing, but only the two of us. And women's soccer was training offsite because their games were not where where the Olympic stadium was. So we were the only team there. One day we just said, okay, we're gonna go out, we're gonna walk around the village, gonna take our pictures, get that all out of our system so we're ready to play. We're at the Olympic rings where you have to go and take pictures and jump, and we were doing a big jump. And there were all kinds of cameras. I mean, big cameras with big lenses and, it was a huge scrum and I, we had no idea what was going on. And so finally I walked over to someone and I said, why, why are you all taking pictures of us? I said, it's media day at, at the Olympic village. <laughs> okay, nobody told us. So the next day um, we actually find out uh, that we are all over every newspaper because there's nothing else to cover in the Olympics. We just were in the right place at the right time. So we're on the front page of the Sports of Montreal Gazette, the Toronto Star. I think the Vancouver Sun had something. It, everybody had something and so our players were getting all this and I jokingly said, this is going to do more for women's basketball than us winning a game or two, probably. And uh, it was quite incredible. But I mean, the whole experience at the Olympics was amazing. And um, the pageantry is quite something, but it's just another big tournament when you really get down to it and you just have to be ready to play. And we played very well. Yeah, Yeah, obviously. And you've also given seminars and coaching clinics all over the world. What kind of experiences have that been? And, Oh, and comparing basketball here to there, or is it all the same? Um, well, in many ways, Gordy, it's all the same. In many ways, it's the same. I mean, certainly different countries have different styles. Um, I've, I've given clinics, uh, spoken in Spain and um, spoken in uh, Lithuania. Lithuania was uh, the hardest one because the girls 
that I was working with, the young women, they didn't speak much English. So to get them to where we were supposed to go was pretty tough, but they were still, it's basketball is a universal language. And, uh, and I, but I've, I've learned a lot from traveling and playing with the national team. The international game can be quite different than the North American game. I would say um, there's a bit more movement, less putting the ball on the floor, less dribbling and a little more uh, team play, kind of a European style of play. And I think it did influence the way I coach a bit. Um, but I'm just so grateful to have had opportunities to see basketball in all these great places. Remember, we were playing in China and um, people were smoking, smoking in the gym. I was like, there's smoke in here. Like we, were, we were all like, it, you know, or we were playing in, um, I think it was in Mexico, and people were throwing pennies at us. And I was like, okay, people are throwing stuff at us. And, it, you know, just different places you play, the enthusiasm for the game is quite, quite amazing. Yeah, the mores and values of different countries being reflected in, in sport, which Absolutely, is yeah. a great connector. Yeah, oh, it is. And, and I think that's what you find out. We're, we're more similar than we are different when yeah. it comes to sport and, and really who we are. Do you have some highlights uh, other than the Olympics that, uh, from other parts of the world? Um, yeah, I think uh, I remember when I was at SFU, we went down to uh, Jackson, Tennessee, was where the NAI National Championships were. And we were the first team in Simon Fraser history, our women's basketball team, to qualify for a national tournament in basketball, men or women. So it was pretty exciting. And I always used to say to the players, um, you, you can only be first once. Only one person can be first. So we were the first and only can ever say we're the first. So we go down to Jackson, Tennessee, and um, we, there's a big banquet for the teams. And our whole, all our teams sitting there, and of course, with the Simon Fraser clan. And someone gets up and introduces us as the clan, Simon Fraser clan. And there's a lot of booing because you're in the South. Yeah. And just mortified and so it was actually Kyle Rope Jr. the soccer player was the guest speaker so he came up right after all the introductions and we'd been booed and um well our name had been booed and uh he said I think the Simon Fraser University women's basketball team would like you to know that it is clan c-l-a-n and it's a Scottish family and people were like oh <laughs> 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 but it was like oh it's one of those moments that now I laugh but at the at, in a moment you're like okay we want to explain this to everybody so you don't think something's bad but the people in Tennessee were just so kind and so nice and we had so many great memories going there um we went and visited uh, the, uh where Martin Luther King was shot so our whole team was able to go see the Lorraine Hotel and learn something there um on the total flip side we did Graceland um, and, you know, and I think that's, for me as a coach, I've always tried to do things that were outside of basketball so that they have life lessons and, um, and, uh, but yeah, the trips down to Jackson, Tennessee were, were pretty amazing and people were pretty great to us, uh, when we went there. Um, most of my national team ones are just, I mean, a lot of them are just travel stories from hell, to be honest, <laughs> just, just long trips and, and tough trips, but, uh, now they're great memories. And, yeah. Uh, I imagine you still have contact with a lot of those players over the years. And yeah, and I keep in touch with a lot of national team players. Um, keep in touch with a lot of SFU players. And, uh, and that's kind of, I guess that's what's important about coaching. And, and you played and, and you know basketball. And um, it's the relationships you build. I think that at the end of the day are the most important things. I mean, I remember wins and losses for sure. And you hold on to the losses almost more than you enjoy the wins. But, uh, but mostly I just I cherish the relationships I've had with so many incredible women. And young women. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you've, you've, you ended up in South Surrey and at Semiamu and living out here and you and Mike living at Hazelmere. How, how did all that come about? Yeah, so when my mom, um, my mom got quite sick uh, in 2005 and just we made a decision to move back because I wanted to be closer to her. And so we got a um, good six months with her before she passed. So that was the reason for leaving Oregon or I, we, we may still be down there somewhere, but um, it was perfect time. I was glad to come home. And uh, I was still doing national team, so everything was great. I was doing national team, and, and I, Mike and I had always said if we moved back, we were moving to White Rock or South Surrey. We're like, that was it. And I actually have a funny story from that. So we, we looked, we were looking around, we looked at Hazelmere, and we liked it, and Mike's a golfer, and I am now. Um, but, uh, but we kind of went down 8th Avenue, and we're coming over the hill, and that's the first time I'd ever come that way into the water, and I could see the pier, and I said to Mike, is this where we live? Because <laughs> I hadn't actually seen, I didn't know at all. I just knew I wanted to live there. And so every time we come over that hill, if we come together, he goes, this is where we live, just so you know. <laughs> so yeah, we feel pretty lucky to live in this area. And uh, I think he'll have to take me out in a pine box. I'm not sure I'm going anywhere. 
but yeah, it's, um, we want to come back to this area. And how I kind of got involved with SEMI was um, I was I just retired from national team in December 2012 after the Olympics. And I just didn't think I had the energy or could give what I need to give for another four years. It had been 16 years of like every moment of every day of thinking about it all the time. It's just, it was obsessive. And so I was ready to just do something else. I didn't know what, and I thought maybe just retire. And uh, Brian Lee, who was uh, the dad of one of our players, Deja Lee, our point guard, um, he said to me, hey, I've got some kids that I'm working with and I'd love for you to come by and do a couple sessions. So Mike and I went and did a couple sessions and I didn't know, but he was like, mm, hook lines, <laughs> trying to get me hooked. So I, that's all I did, a couple sessions. And then next thing he said, well, would you like to help with this team? And so then I started to go to every practice and not too many of the games, a few games, but I didn't want to travel too much. And then, so I started with a group of kids that Brian had um, and Mike Padgett had, uh, his daughter, and they were about grade five. And so I started working with them, grade five, six, seven. Then Lori Padgett, who's a longtime teacher at Semiamu, um, called me and she said, hey, you know, and I'd worked with her daughter on this club. Hey, you want to meet at a coffee shop and talk about maybe just volunteering at the high school? And again, <laughs> I'm such a sucker. Uh, yeah, so I, I started with her in grade eight, and, and, and we've coached the girls now grade eight, nine, 10, and 11, and this next year will be their grade 12 year and probably my last year. I, I see a picture somewhere with the, either the national team or with, with Simon Fraser and a bunch of the stu these students who were maybe, what, grade two or three or four sitting there with them? Is yeah. that, that, that happened? So I know, and another very strange thing, so I was coached the national team. We had games against China. And we were playing at the Langley Event Center. And someone, unbeknownst to me, said, well, we want to get little girls like they do in soccer yeah. to walk up kind of and stand in front of the team. And I'm like, oh, I love that idea. Yeah, great. I didn't know anything who they were going to contact. So they contact Brian Lee and Mike Patton. <laughs> and next thing I know, these girls. So I have that picture. And in front of my national team athletes are at least one, two, three, I think five or six uh, or seven of the kids that I coached at VSC and, and five or six that were semi kids. So it's just ridiculously strange. And um, then three of our kids made the cadet national team and they went back to a camp in Toronto and two of the national team athletes that were in that picture were coaching them and they were standing in front of them. I was like, it's just, yeah, the connection's unbelievable. Yeah. So that was cool. It was a little foreshadowing, I guess. It was destiny for you. I think it was, yeah. And I really am super grateful that both Brian and Lori got me involved because I think when I finished with national team, I was tired. I was, I don't want to say burnt out, but I was pretty, pretty fried. And I needed um, something that kind of, not that national team didn't bring me joy, but it, it was, it was intense work. And I needed something that kind of brought joy back. And I think it's what I've always wanted to do. And what I always love doing is working with kids. So it was, it was good on both sides, I think. Yeah, and you can see that in you, watching you on the on the bench. You had those moments where you're a little bit intense, but you're pretty relaxed, and uh, yeah. I'm sure far more so when you're coaching the, the semi ammo than you would have been uh, coaching a national team. Yeah, and I always say these semi ammo kids are really good. They got me at the end of my career where I've learned all the crazy lessons, and of course, <laughs> of course a few women got me at the start where I was a rancher and a raver, uh, and I'm, I'm much calmer. But yeah, I really wanted the semi kids to have joy in playing and, and find the joy in playing and hopefully stay in the game. Uh, I think we need more female coaches. And I think I'm hoping that we have four or five that go on to play at university. I don't know that we'll have that many, but that's my hope. Um, but it's up to them. They, they have to decide if they want to keep playing. And we've already had two verbal to their schools. So Deja Lee verbal to university of California, Irvine, UCI, very good academic school. And, and I think she's going to love it there. And then um, Izzy Forsyth, she's committed to University of California, San Diego. So two of them have decided, yeah. Izzy's been over at our house shooting baskets. So I heard. So I heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. So I saw the gym. <laughs> so when you talk about uh, these students and you hear you light up and your face lighting up, well, what are the things you think that uh, these players have taught you over the years? What are the most important things you've learned about yourself and about your way you coach? Yeah, that's a great question, Gordy. Um, and you don't think about it often. You don't think about the lessons you've learned until you're kind of away from it. And I, and I did that with the national team. So I'm probably still in the thick of it with the young ones. But with the high school kids, I think one thing they've taught me is that 
they have lives. It's not just all about basketball. And when you're with the national team, it's just about basketball. Like it, it doesn't mean we don't have relationships. And we, you know, like I said, we were in Chile with the national team and I took them to a chocolate factory and we went through it. I mean, you got to find some things that are outside of basketball, but it's so intense. These kids are also very intense, but, but I don't know. They've just taught me to maybe um, take a step back and realize that, you know, they're not all, they don't all love it like I do, <laughs> but I want them to enjoy it. And so I've had to find that balance between, how hard to push them, and yet it's high school basketball. So you want participation, you want kids that, we have multi-sport athletes, we have some that their first sport is soccer, but they play basketball. Um, Madeline McKinnon, she, a uh, white rock girl, she represented Canada in softball as a youngest player, but she plays basketball, you know, and so I think that's probably something I've learned is that, you know, they like basketball, but they maybe don't love it quite like I do, all of them, but some of them do. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. these ones that uh, then that move on to, to the next level at university. Uh, what kind of message do you, do you give them, given your experience with how in, more intense it gets as you move on? What type of advice do you give to these uh, young athletes who are looking at moving away from home for a first time, which you did in grade 11, but which what they did, and, and the challenges that go with that, and, and how they pick a school, not just for basketball, I assume. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I've helped them through the recruiting process a little bit, but they have such great family support. And that's one thing I'll say. I mean, it's a crazy time with parents. I'm not going to lie. I think you know, this is the helicopter generation like no other ever seen and hopefully no other ever seen again. But the parents that sent me home, I have to say they're great. They've been so supportive. I haven't felt that. So they've really been involved in all their own children's recruitment. If they have questions, Mike and I field them because we have been there. But I did say to them, I think as much as a coach might not be there, you still need to have a connection with your coach. And I think that's really important. Obviously the academics come first, but once that you've picked out good schools and, and to me, if, if our kids are going to schools in Canada or the schools in the UC system, University of California, they're all great schools. So, but you have to get a connect with your coach because you're spending a lot of time with that coach and they have a lot of influence over you in the next few years. So I felt like both the parents and the kids had to get good connects with the coach and then I think having you know seeing yourself fitting that style of play because there's a as we talked to earlier there's lots of different ways to play the game and they, they have to find a style of play I think as it gets closer to them going so now going into their grade 12 year I think I'll be able to talk them through a bit more um, that they they have to be ready to accept a role early they may not play as much as they're used to uh, obviously they likely won't early on um, the intensity of the training is going to ramp up a lot in terms of strength training we do some but strength training conditioning so it's just all going to go up to a higher level yeah. but uh, i think that's probably and then i think i'm going to tell them you be a big sponge go there and learn like be open to learning and uh, learn from your older players and learn from all your coaches and i think first and foremost be a great teammate so you've won a, a number of awards over your coaching and playing career you were named to the Simon Fraser Hall of Fame to the BC Hall of Fame, and you won a national award. Was it uh, the Jeff uh, Gowan Jeff Gowan, Gowan Award for for Coach Jeff? But if you were to think back on the words you said in, in your acceptance speeches, what, did they change over the course of the years? What were the things that you talked about then, and how would that be different from how you're seeing it today? Um, I don't think it would be a whole lot different. I mean, obviously, I thanked my parents and thanked my husband because. Uh, it, they're the people that sort of support you day in and day out. Um, thanked all the players that you're, you're nowhere with. I mean, coaches are nowhere without players. And I say all the time. And even Gordy, I'm just going to jump from the question for a second. Is the semi I mean, we've gone two seasons in a row. Um, well, undefeated last year or the year before. And then last year lost to one Alberta team. Uh, we're saying out undefeated in BC. Uh, <laughs> and, and two provincial championships. And um and you don't do that without players. I mean, I'm a good coach. I, I have a lot of experience and I've studied the game and it's been my profession, but we, we've had great players. So I know any award that I've ever gotten is because I've had really good players. And, um, but, I, but with that said, I've really worked at the game. I, I did my level four NCCP and, um, you know, I, I study, I still, I was, I watched two clinics today online, two coaching clinics. And that's just how Mike and I have always been. And um, he's watching more golf now than he is basketball. <laughs> So he's busy Sunday, you want to watch that yeah, yeah. game. So yeah. in terms of the, the sort of evolution of uh, the psychology of sport, mm -hmm. and it's sort of coming more and more, becoming more and more prevalent, uh, has that been, been an element uh, of your coaching? And I know that uh, Thomas Tutko used to come up to BC and 
and uh, did a lot of work and I did some work with him, but certainly psychological approach and uh, it, it's, there's been a big change in the in addressing coaching, not just from the physical parts, but the psychological. Can you talk a little bit about that? For sure. Um, and, and I've always bought into that my whole life. And, and I had Dr. David Cox come up um, when he was at yeah. SFU yeah. several times. And then with the national team, we had um, Roger Friesen, uh, who's a prof out at UFB. Yeah. Our team leading up to the Olympics. He's, he's worked with Wrestling Canada, Field Hockey Canada. He's great. And I probably learned more from him um, than I did later in my career because I think the technical, tactical stuff I think I had. And, and I can get better, but he really taught me a lot. So, yes. And I incorporated a lot with the high school kids. A lot. And um, actually, maybe even a bit more than I did with the elite athlete because – Seemingly, I think the elite athlete at that point has kind of figured a lot of that out. And um, they may be working directly with a sports psychologist, but high school kids don't. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, we've done, and we actually have done a few online yogas with the team while we, with the semi annual team and working on our breathing and centering. And um, we've done, I talked to them about that during the game. Sometimes in a timeout, we'll all take a deep breath together just to, to center and to settle. And I also have found, um, I just think we've, ah, uh, we're learning how, I think all coaches, we're learning how to demand without being demeaning. And I think that's a really that's so important. Yeah. yeah, it's so important. And I think that it was somewhat acceptable in the 70s and maybe into the 80s to demean a little bit. And I don't mind an odd scream at a kid. I don't think that's going to hurt anyone, but it can't be in a demeaning manner and you can't degrade a, a child. And I remember one time I phoned my dad. This is kind of a, a tough story, but I phoned my dad and I said, I was so upset and I think I couldn't get hold of Mike. So I phoned my dad and uh, I mean, this is only a few years ago. And I was really upset because I'd just seen, a, I think it was a U13 coach, just tearing a strip off a, a couple of girls on his team and they were crying. And it was at the LEC and it was a, you know, an event it shouldn't have been happening at. And I said, and my dad said to me, he said, you know, it's really tough because kids that age haven't developed their armor yet. And I think it's true. You know, like as we get older, you know, kind of deflect things and you're older and you're wiser. But I don't like to see it with kids. So it's not my style with young people. I like to encourage. And I think that's part of the sports psychology is to stay positive, to build their confidence, to believe in them, to make sure they're relaxed and there's no anxiety. And really, at the end of the day, it's a game. Yeah. We play it hard. We try to win. And we give it everything we have. But it's a game. Yeah. So. I had a coach who talked about criticism. He said, uh, take, it, take the criticism seriously, but don't take it personally. Yeah. And that's a very good thing too. So yeah, yeah I, I think because we, you, you do have to be coached. Yeah. And another, you know, interesting story along that sports psychology line, I remember after we'd been with the national team a couple of years and we started to build some relationships, our staff with the players and our very first meeting of the year, it was maybe three years in. And I said to them, we have a request. Uh, the coaches have a request for you. And I said, we have to be able to coach you harder. And they're all like, oh yeah, 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 do it. Go. I said, go it you have to understand what that means and you have to be able to handle what that means when we coach you harder. And, and still, even at that level, some of the athletes have a hard time when you're, when you're super critical and, um, you know, get after them a bit, but they accepted the, the harder coaching. And I think that's part of what turned us around. But uh, yeah, I think sports psychology is so, so important. And, um, and coaches should pay a bit more attention to it. I think they should read up and learn a bit more. We're, we're pretty keen on learning the latest skill and drill, but we don't always want to learn how to work with our athletes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, lengthy, wonderful career that you've had and are continuing to have, what, what are the three or four things that you're most proud of that, in terms of that, the things that stand out for you in that sense? Yeah. Um, I think if I had to say just the number one thing I'm most proud of is, and honestly, it sounds kind of silly, but it's just all the incredible women that I've had the opportunity to work with because I really have been in some incredible situations. I mean, Simon Fraser was outstanding. We were so good for so long. I mean, I think we won... 10 or 11 um, of our uh, uh, conference championships, had a couple undefeated seasons, um, conference seasons. And I worked with so many great women. And I mean, Nadine, Dr. Nadine Karan now, she's a doctor. I, I mean, I have just so many people that went through. Um, Candace Audra, she's a prof at University of California, Irvine. Like these were all just student athletes that you had a little part of their history. So to be part of um, some incredible women's journey, even if it was just for four or five years, it's it, that's what I'm most proud of just being part of that and then keeping in touch and seeing what they're doing. Um, I'm pretty proud of getting a team to the Olympics because really it was uh, when I took over the national team, I took over after Kathy Shields had been there and I phoned Kathy. Well, Bev Smith was in between. I phoned Kathy and was talking to her 
and she's always been a bit of a mentor for me, and Ken and Kathy, and she said to me, Allison, I'm not going to discourage you from taking the national team job, but you're going to have to pay for the last 15 years of non-development. And I was like, uh, or like no development with it. Cause we didn't have junior teams. We didn't put money into it. They only focused on the senior team and that's what happened when the bottom crashed out. So it took a long time, but um, I'm pretty determined and our staff was and the athletes were. So I'm pretty proud of taking a big part of taking the program from 22 to eight to nine. Cause that was tough. It was, you know, we would go into countries and just get hammered by like no name countries. I mean, get beat badly and I'm thinking we should be better than this so that was exciting to be able to do that um I'm really proud of our two provincial championships at semi um I won I won two as a player and then to be able to be part of winning two as a coach I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty jacked about that like people say well where does that rank I'm like it ranks pretty darn high <laughs> yeah um, yeah because uh, and again we did it with multi-sport athletes and great kids and and Lori's a phenomenal teacher coach you know she's a teacher coach so yeah. she had all the organizing of practice times and that I couldn't do it without her. And, and just, uh, so, so those were meant a lot to me. And, um, and I think honestly, maybe probably the biggest thing is doing it with my husband all those years. Yeah. Because, uh, when you do it with someone that you really love and he, he always has my back and he's the one that you know, when things are, when things need to be told straight to me, he can do it. And I, and I don't get all uptight. Like, <laughs> I'm sure you're right. So he was a great assistant coach because he never held anything back. I mean, yeah. certainly not in front of people, but yeah. yeah, but we worked well together all those years. So, yeah. And as you're describing coaching and describing what it is to become a citizen and participate in a, in a society, a, a number of the values that you're talking about and explaining sound very much like it's a, the, your coaching experience and the coaching that you provided have helped people become good citizens and contributing citizens and giving back. Yeah, I sure hope so. And I, and I really believe that because I I've never, when the game's over for me, it's over. I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's hard to let go of losses. And there's still a couple that, you know, on a bad night when I can't sleep might pop into my head. But generally speaking, I think you go out, you give your best. And if you win, you, I mean, I've been watching The Last Dance, as a lot of people have. Yeah, and, awesome. and, you know, I think Michael Jordan's a phenomenal player. I liked him back in the day. I still like him. But I wouldn't want a teammate like that talking to me that way. It would be very difficult in a team sport. And, um, and I think at the pro level, it might be a little easier. Like they put up with him because they're just so good and they're paid so well. But, um, but I, would, I would say I was more, uh, had a more holistic approach to coaching and coaching the whole person and being there for kids and hoping that they do become good citizens, that, that as young women, they find a strong voice. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I'm very proud of that. Yeah. So in terms of the, the future of, uh, of basketball and I guess more broadly the future of society, what, are, what, do, you, what do you see as the future and uh, what changes would you make in terms of being able to look at that and manage that if you had the authority and ability to, to plan the future and using sport and community and contributions to community as part of that or as a value within that? Yeah, that's, that's well, just well said, just the way you said it. I mean, sport is, is valuable to a community. I, I'm, you know, I really hope we have school sport next year. I don't know where that sits. I know people are missing watching sport. I think it brings people together in their backyard and, you know, um, just kids out playing. Uh, I think it's a really, it's a really powerful thing for community. And That's it's true. actually sad when I walk by, um, you know, we have an elementary school on 8th Avenue right across from us. And when I go for a walk or I'm, you know, driving home and I don't see any kids out playing there or I don't hear them right now. Uh, that's hard because it, it's just, I actually like that we can hear the kids from our house. <laughs> but, um, and so I, I think if I could have a little bit of power for a day or two, I think I'd, I'd make, first of all, I'd make, um, I'd, I'd encourage people to be more empathetic and to put themselves in other people's shoes. Like we're so quickly to judge what someone else is doing, but we don't know what they're going through. And I think having coached at all levels and people probably think, wow, every Olympic athlete has it all together. Well, that's just not true. And we're the same as the rest of society. We don't all have it all together at every moment. So if I could get people, you know, encourage people to be more empathetic. And I think that's something that Dr. Bonnie Henry's done, actually. I think she, the way she speaks, the way she approaches things, um, you know, she's very natural and she's very smart. And she's just sort of made it like, look, this is how it is. This is what we have to do. Like, be kind and be thoughtful. And, <laughs> and I think that's a really important thing right now. Um, probably also, I, I would really love to encourage better people to go into politics. <laughs> I mean, is that, is that fair? My niece, actually, my niece um, graduated SFU political science. 
She did a year in um, uh, Ottawa working for the minister of, mm, not sure, can't remember which minister she worked for, loved it. And then uh, wanted to go into politics and got completely discouraged by some really underhanded stuff. And um, she's a lawyer. Uh, in real estate and does, I mean, it, which is kind of funny too, but does a great job in Vancouver, but I really think she would have been a great politician. And so we need, I think we need leaders that have some empathy. I think we need leaders that care about community. And I don't always see that. And and I'm, I'm talking all levels of government. Yeah, no, I think that's very true. Yeah. So that would be something I would really love to encourage people that, but you know, and, and there are some, I mean, you're one, <laughs> but, and, but there, there are some out there. And, uh, and then probably the, the last thing I'd say, just tying sport in that, you know, I, I really, I've coached at a really high level and, and I would say I've been involved in quote high performance sport most of my life, but I think sport is for everyone. I have a hard time when, when, you know, I see us cutting kids in grade eight, like that's really hard for me. I, I mean, I would like to see every kid play. I think community sports should be accessible to everybody. I think we need to bring the cost down of sport for kids. And that's where life lessons are taught. That's where collaborations taught. That's where, you know, um, so many things are taught. So I'd love to see that. Yeah, that could... yeah. It's, it's, and and I, I, I got into politics coaching Little League. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my mom said you should coach Little League. I became a foster parent coaching minor football when kids came out. And I think that uh, those lessons that come fed to it through sport and, and they, they can happen through sport and through culture and through music and all kinds of things. But, yeah. but becoming more than just focused uh, in one area and being holistic as you describe it I think is so important. You know, I think one of the things in sport or in music or in drama or you know if, if you're part of the play at school that means you're accountable to others. You yeah. have to be there on time, you have to know your lines, you have to be part of the team and all those things are important because that's kind of what we need to do in life and society and, and in a family and so even figuring out sometimes I'll say to, the, to our players you know the, they'll they'll be saying something. I said, well, you two, they'll come to me and I'll say, you two work it out. Like, talk about it. Go figure it out. I mean, I'm not going to step into every little situation that you should be able to talk about. And, and, and our kids are good that way. They really know how to kind of face adversity and talk to each other. And I mean, those are, yeah, those are lessons that can be learned in, in gatherings and community and yeah. And they're, they're good at that because you facilitate that because you're the kind of person that presents the opportunity for that to happen. And yeah, you describe yeah. some coaches that don't do that. Yeah, I think that's definitely something I'm proud of in my coaching style is that I, I try to empower them and that it's not all about me and I'm not uh, not too di dictatorial and I, I do, I'd set up a practice plan, but if things aren't going well and I think they need to, uh, I sometimes say, how are we feeling in this? And if they say not great, I'm like, well, let's move on to something else and let them have a voice because they certainly need it when they move forward. They're going to need their voices. And and there's some real bright young women at semi Ammo on that team, so I see where they're going to be somewhere down the road <laughs> and the metaphor you provided in terms of that and and politics is probably pretty similar that uh, the description that you describe the way you've described your coaching is probably the very much the way that we should be functioning in in democracies where we're engaging people meaningfully in meaningful roles that they have a voice and a statement around that and we're not being dictatorial and that may separate us from the more totalitarian governments but uh, certainly we've seen some shifts in the last uh, the last 15 or 20 years, there are about 20 fewer, 15 fewer democracies in the world now because of yeah, some of those exactly. changes becoming more totalitarian. So, yeah, yeah. So we, we need sport. We need, we need you out there coaching, Allison, for <laughs> providing that. There, there's, um, I have a, a Randy Noor. I don't know if you remember Randy Noor. Yeah, I remember Randy. Yeah. Well, his, he has a very good young daughter. He has some good young kids, and he's coaching them at a younger age. And his wife actually coaches Jordan, their, young, their youngest daughter, who's very good and she said you know she's coming to semi in a few years just take a couple years off and then come back and like <laughs> but um but yeah so you see that in the community you think well you know but i i do think there's a time limit on me um that i have to be coaching but i think i'll probably always keep a little hand in somehow i hope um if it's even just working with coaches and i'm involved with the uh coach association of canada right now in a female mentorship program um we meet uh zoom meet uh, once a month and then now i'm mentoring two coaches and i'm with uh shannon miller who used to coach our women's hockey team like there's some really great coaches that are mentoring and so we get together as mentors and then we, we're mentoring female coaches so there's a way to kind of stay involved and and still be a resource so i hope to keep doing some of that stuff yeah, it doesn't sound with your passion that that's something you're going to be able to get away from at all. 
I know I, Mike's going to, Michael, well, hopefully I'll still be married. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much for all your time and your energy and the contributions you've made uh, to our country, indeed to the world, and particularly more recently to Semi Amu, my alma mater, and uh, the school I we went to, and uh, the great contributions you're making across it. So thank you so very much, and my best wishes uh, to you and to Mike for picking a pretty neat place to live and contributing so much to it. It's pretty great. Like I said, I'm not leaving here anytime soon. But thanks for including me in such a great lineup of people that you're speaking to. So yeah, it's pretty lucky I've been asked to engage with some people, and I feel very blessed that I've met some pretty neat people in this world, and you're certainly one of them. Thank you so much. And Mike is too, even though I think he beat me in a couple of games. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. <laughs> All right, take care. Thanks so very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this article. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.